Cool. Yeah. So I'm Daniel Woods, and today I will be speaking to you all about incident response as a lawyer's service. So um, this is about kind of the economic and business structure surrounding how incident response is carried out. And I will try to touch on kind of how that flows through into the technical impl implications of how incident response is carried out. But just to kind of flag up front, this is a non-technical talk about kind of, yeah, the business structure surrounding incident response. Now, this title kind of tries to invoke this populist idea that, yeah, lawyers might be taking over incident response. And of course, that's a provocative title kind of, yeah, intended to produce discussion and there's more nuance than that. And um, equally, this talk could have been called how cyber insurance shapes incident response. So yeah, I will present the slides and then I look forward to discussing this with you because this is a very practitioner focused talk. So this whole research project actually started with this tweet by Pierre where he is expressing concern that incident response, or at least who carries out incident response, is being determined by cyber insurance. And I have, in my PhD, investigated the cyber insurance market. So I had a rough idea of how this might be working, but then I kind of embarked on this research project trying to understand how this works. How does cyber insurance shape incident response? And this used a variety of methods, but in particular expert interviews where I spoke to people in this ecosystem. And one thing that really emerged is it's not just that cyber insurance kind of influences which IR firms are selected. Actually, there's this additional actor, breach coaches, their lawyers, uh, depending how you call them, external counsel, they are also playing a really big role in incident response. Um, so yeah, that is how that kind of provides the motivation for this talk. And we break the talk down into three sections. So first, I would like to sketch to you what incident response as a lawyer's service looks like. Um, then I would like to kind of look into why it's coming about now, because this actually has quite a significant break from how incident response was carried out or at least planned traditionally. And so the middle section looks at what is driving this shift. And we basically identify two issues. First is litigation risk. And the second is cyber insurance. And then the final section of this talk, we'll try to, yeah, kind of pull apart the future looking aspects. Cool. So to understand hotline incident response, it's useful to think about a victim firm and they suffer an incident. And here, when we use incident, we kind of mean incidents that are interesting to the board. So we're not talking about incidents in the sense of the security policy has been violated. Say there's an authentication failure. No, this is things like ransomware, data breach, business email compromise. Um, so the way hotline incident response works out is upon discovering this incident, the victim firm immediately calls external counsel, external counsel and delegates all responsibility to external counsel. I'm just going to take a brief check that sound is OK. Um, yeah, I think it is. Cool. So everything gets delegated to external counsel. Um, and then actually it is, whoops, external counsel who decide what happens next. So they hire a technical person to go into the system and investigate the cause of the incident, the scope of the incident. Um, but in addition, external counsel control maybe if public relations professionals are kind of brought in to help communicate externally. I know Jason Nurse gave a talk about this earlier in the conference. Um, or they might also hire logistics firms to help with, say, credit monitoring, or also, um, say, notifying individuals, things like printing letters, sending letters, which actually become a big logistical problem with the scale of data breaches. They will also advise or potentially liaise with law enforcement and regulators. So the important aspect of this slide is that you see lawyers are at the center of breach response. So to invoke a kind of American sports analogy, 
Lawyers are acting as the breach coach, sorry, the um, quarterback of incident response. They're deciding who gets brought in um, and whether they get brought in. But a separate way of looking at the difference between kind of hotline incident response and traditional incident response is to look at the timeline. Um, and this really kind of highlights the contrast. So in conventional incident response, it always begins with the planning before an incident has even occurred. So the organization write the incident response plan that delegates responsibilities. It may also set up monitoring infrastructure to continually monitor the um, network. And it puts a plan in place. What happens when an incident is detected? How, is, um, how are decisions kind of elevated through the hierarchy? Um, yeah, so the point here is that conventional incident response always had this ex ante aspect. And I think an important thing to consider here is that actually requires a lot of information security maturity. The organization needs to appreciate that cybersecurity is a risk that may threaten their organization and to put this plan in place. Whereas that's potentially less true for hotline incident response. So here we kind of contrast that hotline incident response begins when the incident has been detected. So the victim firm says, oh, we have, say, a ransomware incident, or perhaps someone else notifies them that they've been compromised. Um, and then it begins when the breach coach is hired. So they call a breach coach, um, set up a contract, and then it kind of all unfolds from there. And a second difference that's maybe worth emphasizing is hotline incident response is driven by litigation risk. So the lawyers are very aware that potentially the organization will be sued and sued in the future, and that shapes the incident response. Now, of course, this dichotomy is kind of somewhat artificial because in a conventional incident response plan, you may bring a lawyer in, it may even be an external lawyer. You still are concerned about litigation, but here we're trying to kind of tease apart the differences. Cool. So a very real question, very fair question that you might ask me now is, OK, so you've described this model of incident response, but yeah, is it important? Is it prevalent? And yeah, here I'm kind of pulling together a few industry statistics. So CrowdStrike report that half of their investigations are under this model of incident response. So that is where external counsel and external lawyer directs um, yeah, directs the forensic professionals. Um, there's a company who run a market survey of firms in the cyber insurance ecosystem, and they discover or they survey 23 law firms who collectively have managed almost 5,000 breaches in 2018. And of course, here we run into the usual problem with industry reports. What is a breach? What is an incident? But I think the scale here is important. And particularly of these 5,000 breaches, sorry, of these 23 law firms, it doesn't even include all the law firms who are operating as kind of, yeah, breach coach or um, running incident response as a lawyer's service. So there's another firm, Baker Hustetler, who also claimed to have worked over 750 incidents. This firm's useful because they publish um, yearly reports and we can see that they grew from 200 incidents in 2014 to over 1,000 in 2020. And I don't have definitive evidence about this, but I suspect incident response as a lawyer service has followed this, yeah, kind of a similar growth pattern to Baker Hustetler, but across the whole industry. Cool. So now we've kind of outlined this model of incident response. And the kind of natural next question is, why has it come to be? So client attorney privilege plays a huge role in this. So of the law firms who claim to run the most incidents or in the past to have run the most incidents, I think of the top four, all four operate under the breach coach trademark. So yeah, you've probably heard me name drop this a lot. If you're speaking to people in the cyber insurance ecosystem, you basically call yeah, lawyers who help with incident response, breach coaches, um, but potentially it's unfamiliar. So the trademark holder's blog explains that the most important thing that a breach coach does is protect client attorney privilege. And this is to do with litigation risk. So in the course of litigation, potentially the victim firm who have suffered the incident could be sued. And as part of that, 
the um, defense attorneys might use some legal mechanisms around discovery that would force the victim organization to kind of publish evidence that's relevant. So with relevance to incident response, this could be the forensics report because potentially the people who've investigated the computer system after uh, the incident have established that basic cyber hygiene wasn't followed and this might have kind of yeah, relevance to litigation. So of course this creates litigation risk that the organization is producing evidence that may be used against them. So one thing that breach coaches offer is that they can claim before court that that forensics report was protected by client attorney privilege. It was produced in the communications between a client and an attorney. And US law recognizes that this is, um, yeah, this is a valid reason to not publish that evidence. So here we see that one of the most important things that breach coaches are doing is, yeah, mitigating litigation risk. So the second reason um, that the breach coach model or incident response as a lawyer service is kind of increasing in popularity is related to cyber insurers. So there's this survey that I spoke about before and we ran a kind of secondary analysis of this, but essentially there's a really strong relationship. The lawyers who have more relationships with cyber insurance providers also run the most cases, the most incidents. So yeah, we see this relationship. The more you know the cyber insurance people, the more work you seem to have. But, so this was the point, if you recall to the motivation slide, Pierre was raising this problem of insurers gatekeeping work. So we have kind of anecdotal evidence that this is going on. But then what I really wanted to understand was how do they do this? How do insurers, because this is actually quite a big problem. How do insurers force a victim firm Wow, okay, so this language is quite strong, but how do insurers shape which firm the victim uses? Um, <clears throat> and this is, this is a common problem. So if for the kind of car drivers among us, we have auto insurance and part of the auto insurance policy might be that going to a mechanic is covered by insurance. And we kind of know in most auto insurance policies, we can't go to any mechanic. The insurer says there is this list of mechanics who you are authorized to use, otherwise we won't indemnify um, your payment. So insurers, cyber insurers do exactly the same thing. It's not particularly surprising, but the cyber insurance policy will say um, it explicitly covers vendors on the panel. So this is a list of um, firms that the insurer builds who they're willing to indemnify. And there are additional ways to get um, your incident response firm onto this panel. So for instance, this is the conventional route. So this panel, this list of vendors applies to all of the cyber insurance, um, cyber insurers customers. So if you as a vendor get your name on this panel, then potentially you can work for all of the um, customers. So this is yeah, a very valuable business opportunity. And what, what we kind of actually find is that firms are investing a lot of resources into yeah, building relationships with insurers to be put onto these panels. Um, but there is an alternative way, which I think is important to flag ahead of time. So if you already have a relationship with the policyholder, so perhaps you've worked together on past incidents, you can ask the policyholder to request that you are written into their policy. So this way the insurer will still possibly subject to further conditions, but the insurer will still indemnify your services. So yeah, all hope is not lost. Just make sure you speak to your clients so that they ensure that you are written into their policy. But importantly here, you would only be written into their policy. So one, one thing we can study is we can just look to these panels and try to understand who is on the panels, which firms are insurers saying that after an incident, you can use these firms. So we see that here, so the firms at the bottom are the biggest cyber insurers, they sell the most insurance. And then as we go up, they kind of fall down in the rankings. So for instance, Chubb are saying that on their panel, there are 11 forensics firms. AXA, it's 10. 
So here we see how insurers are gatekeeping work. The work or the majority of the work is going to the firms on the panel. And actually that's quite a small number of the kind of potential number of incident response firms out there. But then there's a secondary aspect to this, and this is where breach coaches come in. So right now, probably you're banging your drum, cyber insurers are the problem. Um, but what happens in reality is the victim firm gets told, if you have an incident, you should call this hotline operator. And most often in the US, the hotline operator is an external counsel, a breach coach, a law firm. Um, and they do that because it helps with litigation risk, it helps to claim claim attorney privilege. But what this mean, means is that the breach coach can actually recommend to the victim firm which forensics provider to hire. So this is where I think I would qualify Pierre's kind of initial tweet, um, because actually it's not just that cyber insurers are gatekeeping work, it's also that breach coaches have a huge influence. And yeah, right now we're talking about incident response, potentially technical incident response, but this also impacts which public relations firms are hired and which notification and credit monitoring firms are hired. And it also affects relationships with law enforcement and regulators. So yeah, to kind of summarize this, insurers ensure work goes to lawyers by, and the forensics firms that they favor by building this panel of firms and the breach hotline operator triages by recommending specific firms. Um, and that hotline operator tends to be an external law firm in the US and also to get onto the panel, perhaps we missed this, uh, providers must commit to contractual terms. So for instance, this tends to be things like an hourly rate for complex investigations. And even for certain investigations, you have to commit to a fixed price. So for a business email compromise, it might cost $2,000. Um, and most people in the industry will say that these rates tend to be lower than both for a given firm, that rate that they give to insurers tends to be lower around 30% based on my data. Um, and also the firms who uh, yeah, are kind of put onto these shortlists tend to charge lower rates. Okay, I'm just being conscious of time. So yeah, we don't, I mean, we don't need to, to labor this, but essentially when the contract is being negotiated, we see a similar thing. Insurers have ultimate approval and a lot of aspects of the negotiation has happened way back in time when the panel was being built. We also have this weird aspect where there's kind of these nested contracts. So it's not a clean cut. There's no clean cut way of describing this, but often what happens is that the breach coach will actually hire the vendor. So they will write up the contract, sign it, um, and then often another curious thing about this ecosystem is there can be further subcontracting. So often the negotiation with a ransomware provider will also be subcontracted and sometimes even ransomware payment. Okay, so I'm super conscious of time. Um, <clears throat> I think this is an important one because it speaks to, so, so far we've shown that insurers kind of control which IR firm is chosen. But there's this question, how do insurers evaluate, yeah, evaluate the quality of the work, whether things are going well? And again, what we see is that breach coaches are in the middle of this. So the vendor is asked to kind of report to external counsel, often informal, based on the investigation, and then it's external counsel who feedback to insurers. And this becomes even more confusing with reports. So, Following a forensic investigation, it's often expected that there's a formal report documenting what happened. Now, most vendors I spoke to said they are less likely to write that report if they are reporting to an external counsel. Because as you can imagine, if this report is written, then yeah, it creates litigation risk because it could be discovered, it could be brought up in court. And then also when you speak to insurers, what you find is that for instance, I spoke to one major US insurer who said they saw less than 10% of the forensics reports about the incidents for which they paid a claim out. So often they are paying thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands, millions even of dollars in a claim and not seeing the forensic report 
understanding what the root cause was. So again, we see external um, cancer at the center of things. Okay, um, and often that forensics reports, there was an interesting anecdote I had from one investigator who said that they would share spreadsheets that kind of explain which information the lawyer or the law firm is interested in getting, and those would be tailored to the law, for, to the law firm or even the lawyer. Um, yeah, so this is just showing how central law firms are to incident response in this model, in this ecosystem. Cool, so there's not so long left of the talk, so I'll begin to kind of probe the forward-looking things. So this slide, um, understanding the graph exactly isn't so important, but essentially what we see is on the left-hand side, there is a large majority of firms who have just one relationship with one insurer. And then as you go up, you find actually, so here the, the um, data points around 19 show that there are three firms, one legal and two communications firms who have 19 relationships with, of, with the insurers of the 24 we saw. Um, so yeah, we can map this differently showing the specific firms. So maybe you have worked with some of these firms in the past, but for instance, Mullen Coughlin, they have been listed by 80% of the insurers in our sample. And they would claim, for instance, that they are running over a thousand. I think they claim recently to be running thousands of cases every year, incidents, sorry. Um, yeah, and you see some of the other firms. So these four firms, Lewis Brisbane, McDonald Hopkins and Baker Hustetler, they all run under the breach coach trademark. Um, you can also see which forensics firms are kind of favored here. So a lot of these firms are new, they kind of emerged in the last yeah, 10 years, and a lot of it is linked to cyber insurance. So one of the firms with among the most listings said that their real breakthrough as a forensics firm was they were added to a cyber insurance panel in the early years, maybe eight years ago, and then they just blew up in um, yeah, kind of size and the number of incidents they were running. Uh, and what you will also notice is the firms who you would associate with having kind of network monitoring products like CrowdStrike, FireEye, Verizon, they actually have among the kind of, yeah, they're not so well represented in this. And this reflects a reality that many of these firms in the cyber insurance breach coach world of incident response are responding without having pre-existing network and capture technology. So they have to rely on the lugs that were in place by the, um, that were ran by the client. So they're moving in unfamiliar environments. Um, so yeah, these are all considerations to have. Yeah, so this is just kind of a short summary. I think uh, point three is probably important, which is that in this ecosystem, there's this feeling that there's always a firm offering a lower price. And this is really a downward pressure on prices. Um, and some of these firms are venture capital firms running at a loss. So it's a very competitive ecosystem and people are competing on price. Okay, so these are the things that are really difficult to analyze as a researcher. So if you have ideas on how to analyze these things, I would love it if you got in touch. But right now we can kind of only point to industry reports that provide yeah, clues about what's happening with the quality of incident response. Because yeah, I'm sure even just the concept of measuring the quality of incident response could produce an entire workshop. Um, but what we can see is for instance, Baker Hustetler report that investigation costs are falling year on year. But they also report that in the process of doing that, forensics firms are moving towards automated triage scripts and away from kind of bespoke malware analysis. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna skip this point. One point that I think is important is often we think about, so here there's a picture of a guy in a cheap suit. And the point that I think is important to make is that sometimes, although we, yeah, okay, let me make this point well. Although we think cheap suits are always a bad thing, often they're perfect for the purpose. So for instance, if you work a job like I do, you kind of only really have cheap suits because you're an academic going to conferences and it's not so important. Um, but the important thing is that 
people have the right kind of product or service for their purpose. So if cyber insurance has created a lot of cheaper incident response, then that's great, providing those um, firms are responding to the right incidents. So in some sense, maybe the more expensive IR firms who have yeah, pre-existing network technology capture, perhaps that is necessary to respond to higher capability um, attackers. Okay, then, yeah, I mean, the other point I'd want to make that I could leave you with is this saying, it's a great saying, to the man with only a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. I think it's pretty clear that breach coaches um, and external counsel see litigation risk. They are primarily interested in yeah, mitigating litigation risk. Um, whereas some incidents are kind of unrelated to litigation risk. So for instance, ransomware is almost entirely driven by technical risk. And here we see that from 2018 to 19, there was a 1000% increase in ransoms paid. Um, yeah, we have some more points there. But the point I'd really like to leave you with, this is kind of the core point of the talk, is that law firms have ascended to the top of the incident response hierarchy, and they've been helped by insurers in doing so. And that creates a lot of open questions that I think the first community should be addressing. How does that impact the quality of our IR? And how does it change who is doing IR? And then also the question that is kind of relevant to a conference like this is how will this emerging set of actors, the forensics firms that I described, or even the breach, coach, breach coaches, how will they be integrated into the wider incident response community? Because very few of those firms were first members. Cool. So yeah, I know it was a somewhat provocative talk and I'm sure you have many comments. So yeah, I look forward to seeing you in the 8-bit Q&R, Q questions and answers room. Thank you very much.